Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Obscurathon Part 2. We had such fun with it last year that I decided to do it again. And this year, we're going to be looking at four obscure cartoons. But this time around, we have a theme. Science Fiction! We're going to see aliens and spaceships and distant planets. And we're starting off with something that I've been looking for for a long time. Ah, Fox Kids, you filled the 90s with so many great shows. Carmen Sandiego, The Tick, Bobby's World, Batman, X-Men, fucking Power Rangers. Come on. Hey, listen, I may be a child of the 80s, but 90s, you're all right. But alongside their standard programs, Fox also produced a miniseries called Red Planet, based on the book by Robert Heinlein, which is what we're going to be looking at today. The series opens in the wilderness of a planet called New Ares, where we see a harsh alien wilderness with all kinds of fierce creatures. We also see a colony of humans, where we meet our main character Jim, his younger sister PJ, and his dad, voiced by the great Mark Hamill in a rare non-bad guy role, no less. That means this rock is filled with iron oxides. If we can find a way to free the oxygen from the planet's core, we can create a breathable atmosphere. Imagine being able to breathe outside without a respirator. Imagine that desert out there covered with lush green fields. Okay, I'm gonna pause here for a second because I'm sure those of you who are familiar with the book have already noticed there are some major changes. These will be addressed later. I can hear you typing already. Just hold your horses! By the way, gotta love those tiger stripes on Jim's helmet. I'd like to think in the future, spacesuits will become fashionable. Anywho, inside the Agrodome, they discover our other main character, Willis, who's some kind of hairy, shape-shifting alien slime ball. I want one. Also, he talks like a parrot. What is that thing? I found them in the agrodome, Mom. Can I keep them? Hey, wait. Well, Jim, I, uh, don't know what to say. Your husband tried to talk him out of it, but he won't listen. And you think he will listen to me? And you think he will listen to me? 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 I think he's telling us his name. Aren't you Willis? Aren't you Willis? Willis does his best to fit in, but keeps getting into trouble. Willis! Willis, come back here! I can't see. Hey, look out! Oh, no! I thought I told you to leave Willis at home. Good thing he's adorable. Aw, oh, just look at that face. How could you stay mad at him? Though they may want to consider neutering, he seems to have a habit of latching onto people's legs. So Jim and his dad are doing some work at the mines when one of the workers comes down with a case of... Space Madness. And goes ape shit. He tries to take Jim hostage, but Willis comes to the rescue. Willis hungers for flesh. Must lay eggs in stomach. They end up getting trapped, and Willis goes for help, revealing that he's been learning this whole time and not just mimicking things he hears. Willis get help. Willis get my prayer. Help him. Holy cow! Did you say you're not just repeating? You can understand? Willis listen, Jim. Willis learn. Oh, Jim stay. Willis get help. I wonder if this will be a plot point. Foreshadowing. Also, it seems that a lot of the miners have been coming down with... Space Madness. And nobody knows why. Jim's mother, the lead medical officer, pleads with the head of the mining company to shut down the mine. But he's having none of it. We're talking just new Aries flu, General. We've got cases of acute paranoia and homicidal behavior. The whole colony's in danger. Do you have any evidence connecting these problems with the mines? No, but I will. Until you do, those mines remain fully operational. I won't allow you to jeopardize our production quotas based on women's intuition. Hmm, an evil corporation in a science fiction story. Those usually fare well, don't they? 
Some time passes and one of the workers thinks that Willis is the cause of the sickness and tries to get rid of him by feeding him to creatures called water seekers. Badass alien raptor things that sniff out sources of water. Jim saves him but crashes his speeder bike so Willis goes to find help. No one's in there. Uh, Willis, it's not a good idea for an alien to lunge at humans like that. No, you blow the whole dome! Oh. Ah, see? Look what happened. Ah, but they're alright. Until this guy shows up. But luckily, he faints. Okay? Anyway, it turns out Jim and PJ are being sent to the Academy. The Academy of what? I don't know, it's not really explained in the miniseries. To all incoming students, greetings, and welcome to Lowell Academy. I am Marcus Howe, your headmaster. Uh, though I hope that over time, you will come to think of me as a friend. Your best friend. Oh, and don't worry, I'm not evil. And it seems Willis snuck along for the ride, but is soon discovered by the headmaster, who's oddly content with him staying. Sir, I can explain. I mean, this is my friend, Willis. He's not in captivity, oh. sir. He's my friend. I, I rescued him, well, sort of. Where I stay, Jim. How extraordinary. Like a parrot. No, sir. He can really talk. Mind you, keep this room secure. We don't want... <laughs> Willis. Wandering the halls. Gives me the creeps. And let's forget about the demerits for today. Did I mention that I'm not evil? So it turns out that Wayland Corp wants Willis because they believe they can synthesize his glands into some kind of cure for the illness affecting the miners so they can keep working. The, the, the company is eager to acquire a roundhead because a South Colony doctor has closed the mines? You got any idea what it's costing the company to keep those mines shut down? But it's not for much longer. The company plans to handle the good doctor. You, but weren't the miners getting ill? <laughs> they were dropping like flies. But the Sydneysium ore they were getting was making the company billions. Now you take your basic roundhead. As far as the company could figure, nothing phases them. The boys back on Beta Earth figure they've got some sort of special gland. If the company can get its hands on a live roundhead, then the lab coach can hack out the gland and clone some sort of serum for the miners. Might not save the miners, but it'll keep them going longer. But through the power of plot convenience, Willis escapes and shows Jim and PJ a recording of Lex Luthor here plotting to kill their mom. Yeah, apparently Willis can record video. Man, now I want one even more. Jim sneaks out of the academy and tries to get back to the colony to warn everyone, but with the evil corporate guys and alien monsters after him, will he make it? When we last left Jim, he was making some new friends when PJ shows up to save him. But it looks like they were followed by trackers sent out by the evil corporation. No! We'll never defeat the corporation! They get caught and are taken aboard. Captain Brescia, stabilized. Air filters operational. What? Are they breathing oxygen? Those are robots, right? Look, they clearly have oxygen supplies. And they take their masks off. Why? Why do the robots need oxygen? Hey! Hey, where are you going? Come back here! This is a question that needs to be answered! Lisa, do robots need oxygen? Robots have no need for inefficient things such as oxygen. Huh, what do you know? My robot's more realistic than these robots. Before they got on, Jim punctured the water tank to attract water seekers. 
the air-breathing Terminators get taken out, but there's still the little problem of getting killed themselves. Yeah, Jim didn't really think this one through, but I'm sure he'll come up with something. Smile, you son of a bitch! After that, they continue their way to the colony, however their oxygen supply is running low and freezing night is coming. So they decide to spend the night in a giant piranha plant that hopefully won't eat them. Jim, I don't know if I can do this. Okay, turn on your flashlight, suit lights, anything! Photosynthesis. If we can get enough light going in here, this plant could make some oxygen. Science! It does keep them safe through the night, but when the sun comes up, there's still the little problem of their air supply. Yeah, our heroes don't really have much forethought. But luckily, they're found by these things. These creatures are referred to as locals. Such an imaginative name. Anyway, locals were thought to have been very aggressive and would kill humans if they saw them. What is it, Doc? A local? If it were a local, do you think you'd be alive to tell the tale? But it turns out they want to help them. Oh, but that's not all. I've heard stories, but I didn't think they really existed. And... and why are they helping us now? Jim, help Willis, friend. Best friend. But Willis... Why are they helping you? Help Willa? Because all connected. All together. Huh? What? I don't understand. No. Oh, like Jim and Father. Wait a minute. You mean you're gonna grow up and turn into a local? Oh, wow! Yeah, it turns out that locals start out as cuberts and eventually metamorphosize. As they get taken back to South Colony, the locals show them how their planet changed over time. Other life forms came to New Ares millions of years ago. PJ, the locals aren't just taking us back to South Colony. They're taking us back through time. Willis, what's happening? I mean, what happened? They hurt themselves. It's pollution. They polluted themselves out of existence. They're using New Aries as a dump. Why, if I didn't know better, I'd say this miniseries is trying to tell us something. And you guessed it, it turns out South Colony is sitting right on top of the alien toxic waste, which is what's making the miners sick. Oh, 90s, you and your environmentalism. They make it back and discover their parents were trying to shut down the mine, but Kingpin showed up to blow the mines up so they can harvest the ore. But of course, things go wrong. The explosions expose the toxic waste and everything starts blowing up. Jim and Willis come up with an idea to stop the destruction, though I'm not entirely sure how it's supposed to work. Then the locals show up to take care of the evil company. No, please! Willis, help me. Make them stop, please! They hurt Jim. They hurt Willis. That doesn't mean we get to hurt them back. Sure it does. Someone ever tries to kill you, you kill them right back. Ah, uh, well, they let them go, and the locals use their power to transition 70 years in the future, where the planet is green again, and we have our closing dialogue. Together, we have learned to live in peace as friends. Jamie, it's supper time. Come on up now. Okay, I'm coming. Um, Mom, can Willis come too? <laughs> of course, Willis is always welcome. I want to hear more stories about Grandpa. Okay, Willis? Jamie, your grandfather Jim was the most important person I ever knew. He was my best friend. And that's the Red Planet miniseries. Okay, first let me just say what a pain this series was to find complete. I had to stitch this thing together from clips I found on YouTube and a bootleg I found at a convention to fill in the gaps. The complete miniseries, my ass! Also, look how bad the cover is. It's just the cover of the book with a cartoon Willis forcefully photoshopped in. 
Someone at Fox better get off their ass and give this an official release already. Because I demand quality, goddammit! Oh, and yes, for once I've actually read the book the thing I'm reviewing is based on. In fact, when I saw this series during its first run, I actually actively sought out the book just so I could read it. Imagine that! TV leading to reading! Though admittedly it's been a while since I read it, but I do recall several of the changes I mentioned earlier. One of the biggest ones was that the planet they were on was actually Mars and not some made-up planet called New Ares. I'm not really sure why they had to change that. When you hear Red Planet, you instantly think of Mars. What, were they afraid Mars was gonna sue them or something? Another was that the miners getting sick wasn't the focus of the original story. Rather, the prevention of the colony migrating to avoid the Martian winter just so the company can save money. I do recall the book having some environmental undertones, but making it the focus of the series was kinda typical for the time. It was the 90s after all. Heh, <laughs> they thought computers were gonna end the world in the year 2000. There were a lot more changes from the book, like they left out some characters and a couple of names were changed, but it would take far too long to go through everything. However, despite the changes and some clunky animation, I really liked this miniseries. It may not be exactly like the book, but as a science fiction adventure for kids, I think it's great. It's got mature and sometimes dark themes, it's got likable characters and persistent heroes that have a good family dynamic. The book is much easier to find, and I do recommend it, but if you're lucky enough to find the complete miniseries, check it out. Well, that's one down. Next time we're going to be looking at a movie that I can only describe in two words. Space Bears. He's okay.